Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Bitwise Day 50, uh, 43, uh, where we code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. So last three sessions, we covered a bunch of assembly language stuff. Uh, don't want to talk more about it today, except maybe to highlight. Uh, actually, let me just highlight a few improvements I made to the text and that I checked in in this asm.txt file uh, with this sort of a, run, a running notes uh, that we wrote live on stream and that I've been editing since then if I saw something that I thought needed fixing. Um, one of them is that I added some obvious optimizations to some of the switch uh, the switch logic for the jump table stuff. Um, and uh, I just wanted to, to show it so that you're not left with the impression that uh, what I showed was the optimal thing. Uh, and again, I wasn't super focused. I think I mentioned right at the beginning, I'm not focused on teaching people how in, in this mini tutorial to teach people how to write like highly optimized assembly at the same time though um, for some of these idioms it's worth getting used to some of the tricks so you can just incorporate them in your tool bag um, and so here if you recall this is sort of the um, you know direct translation from the logical uh, process to assembly code without any fancy optimizations so we have two branches uh, for doing a range check, and then we do a subtraction. We do a multiplication by four via a left shift. Uh, we load the address of a table, and then we uh, we add that offset to the base address that we've loaded for the table, and we do that load, which is a code co uh, you know, code address, and then we jump to that code address, which corresponds to the label we want to handle. Um, so here's um, here's here's the first one that's uh, you see this in. Uh, and the compilers all do this, uh, and this is actually something that uh, is good to learn if you're ever writing range checks, integer range checks, is that, and it's especially fortuitous here because we actually need to subtract by the min value of the range uh, after passing the range checks in order to do our table lookup, but even without that it's helpful. So basically you can turn two branches into a subtract uh, by the min value and a single branch. So basically what you do is note that these comparisons here are signed comparisons. They don't have a U at the end of, of the B mnemonic. Um, here we're using U and what, what we're doing is we're subtracting the min value. And so now the legal range goes from zero up to max value minus min value, which means that we can check for containment in, in the interval using a single test because anything that was less than min value is essentially wrapped around. Uh, and so using a single unsigned comparison, we can test for containment. And so this is obviously a good thing. Um, and, and additionally, in our specific case, because not only not only is this sub good because it lets us do a single branch to check for a range containment, but it also is something we would have had to do anyway uh, after passing the range checks in the old code. So this is just pure win, uh, however you look at it. Um, here's another one which I thought was sort of a good uh, cautionary tale. Um, so this looks about as simple as it gets. We load the address of the switch table, we add the offset to that base address, we load from there and jump to uh, to that code address. Um, now LA is a pseudo instruction. Um, it consists under the hood of two parts, a, a LUI or an AUI PC, depending on whether it's a PC relative or absolute, but either way, uh, two instructions. Uh, and then the lower, uh, the lower bits are added in using an add immediate instruction. Um, now, one of the dangers of, uh, of of doing this kind of thing using LA is that it might not uh, optimization opportunities may be hidden because you you in your brain you think of this as a single monolithic uh, thing where really it's multiple parts that may be uh, mergeable with other parts. And so here's the uh, the optimization. Um, basically, T T two is the uh, is the base address, and we can just move it into um, you can just move it into the immediate offset of the load. Um, so T1 here is the offset plus the high bits from the LUI, and then we add in the low bits here. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. And incidentally, the reason I came across this was that uh, I was looking at uh, the output for switch case uh, for switch statements in uh, both the GCC and the playing backends. Uh, for Risk Five, and neither of them were actually doing this. And after talking to some people who work on it, it looks like uh, one of the problems why the optimizer didn't see the odd opportunity is because it has to move the 
the addition of the low bets past the uh, the add with the shift of the offset and stuff like that. So it wasn't able to see that opportunity. But anyway, um, this saves an instruction in one cycle on a typical uh, microarchitecture. So not, not a huge deal, but again, it's worth, for these canonical idioms, it's worth kind of shaving them down to something that you can uh, that you can memorize or whatever and, and bring it along with you. Um, did I do other stuff here? I don't think I, I, I fixed some, some typos uh, here. Oh, um, this is something, actually, let me cover this because I didn't cover this on stream. This is something I wrote afterwards that I had been meaning to cover. Um, Um, so, so a note on flattening expressions and how to allocate registers for them. So I, I had covered, I had mentioned at the very beginning of the series that, you know, the way we handle expressions is we sort of unnest them, we flatten them and assign temporary variables, which turn into temporary registers for, for storing their intermediate results and then combining those, et cetera, until we totally computed the, the value of the original expression. Um, and so here I just wanted to point out a potential pitfall or, or something to look out for when you're flattening expressions. So first off, here's a generic recipe for flattening a, an expression. So suppose you have a general sub-expression A, so A stands for sub-expression, B stands for sub-expression. Those don't have to be like constants or variables. They can themselves be compound expressions. So op could be plus and A could be X times Y, right? Something like that. So this is just the top level of the expression. A and B can themselves have a complex structure internally. So here's the generic structure, and this is in fact how you generate code for this in a simple one-pass compiler. Um, left to right code translation. So you first generate the code uh, corresponding to A, uh, evaluating A, and putting it in some temp register T1. So this is not a fixed register, this just stands for some free temp register. Um, and after that, you do the same thing for B, and you put that result into T1. And then you overwrite T1's value using the operator uh, applied to T1 and T2. So if op is plus and a and b are some compound expressions, maybe they have multiplications or whatever, um, this essentially is just a, an in-place addition of t1 to t2. Um, and like I said, you apply this recursively if a and b themselves have complex internal structure. Like you first have to do the multiply if there's one inside a, and then when you come up, you do the addition at the top level. But anyway, so here's how you would do that if you just have a chain of additions. Um, uh, following the recipe. So here I'm, I'm, I'm treating it left associatively as if the uh, AST for this is left leaning, which is uh, by default if you're using the kind of left associative uh, parsing that we've been using in uh, in all of our expression parsers, both in ION and the assembly language actually. Uh, this is the kind of code you get out of it. Um, you, you first descend recursively into the left tree, which bottoms out in A, so A gets the first register, B gets the second one, uh, then you combine these, then C, which is the next one up, uh, gets loaded, and then you combine that, D gets loaded, you combine that. So even though this is a, a four operand addition, uh, if you think of it as an AST, there's four leaves. Uh, this only ever requires two, uh, two temp registers to, to evaluate, um, and that's true for an arbitrarily long chain of additions. Uh, and so, yeah translates straightforwardly to assembly. Here we're assuming that A, A, B, C, D are globals that have to be loaded uh, just to make it a little more interesting so they don't already live in registers. That kind of obfuscates the uh, the point I was making. So, um, but, but but yeah, so the cautionary tale about this is when you're doing this left to right translation uh, and register allocation approach, you have to be careful about um, the, the way things are associated, the way uh, the AST is leaning, whether it's leaning left or leaning right. Because suppose we take the very same expression, like it has the same value, but suppose the AST is uh, right-leaning, so it's associating to the right. Um, then the problem is, uh, we first, as before, because we're doing left-to-right recursive translation, we descend into the left subtree of the root, that's A, then we have to store that in the temp register, then we recursively descend into the right subtree, of which we first descend into the left subtree, which is B. And then, so now we have to store B in a temp variable. But while all this is going on, we still have to keep A alive or the temp register that A lived in. And the same is true all the way down. So what you see here is when you're doing this left to right translation and, and uh, stack like register allocation on this right associating, uh, right associated expression, you end up building up basically a, a big stack of temp values without any reductions. And then you only do the reductions at the end. 
So you build up this whole stack of, of things in temp registers, and then you start collapsing them down. And eventually you do end up with a final result in T1. But compare that to here, which is more of an iterative flat um, uh, reduction. This is called a left fold, and this other thing is called a right fold. And you can see the, the difference is palpable. This thing requires constant amount of registers, even for an, an arbitrarily long chain of additions. This one requires uh, as many temp registers as there are operands, which is a disaster, right? Um, that uh, as soon as you have complex expressions, this really adds a lot of register pressure for no good reason. So really all I wanted to say here is that here's a recipe you can use. And as long as you're using things that are naturally left-leaning, um, even without an optimal register allocation algorithm, this tends to do really good. Uh, you can find pathological cases where they don't do so great, but as long as you're not um, artificially right associating things and then doing the left to right translation, uh, things are usually very good. And there is a, this optimal algorithm if you want to see how it works. In um, I think I, I, I threw out this name last time, Sethi Seth Allman, the standard textbook algorithm for how to do uh, optimal register allocation for some definition of optimal. And it's basically just a fancier version of this, where at every level of the tree, rather than doing a fixed ordering, like always doing left to right or always doing right to left, it evaluates whether to do the first do the left part or the right part at every level of the tree uh, in order to minimize register pressure. Um, but in any case, yeah, just wanted to throw that out there. Um, and um, this kind of thing, incidentally, this left to right translation stack like allocation approach. Um, is probably how we're going to do a first risk five backend. So this is not just academic. This is exactly how people typically write run uh, how people do register allocation for expressions in one pass compilers. All right. Um, let's see here. Okay, so for today, um, this is going to be a little bit of a, uh, I, I guess, a, a slower startup stream because, um, well, one, I don't have as much prepared as I wanted because I woke up super late and I was planning on having several hours to prep before we started and I just rolled out of bed, basically took a shower and started streaming. Um, but um, I said that I wanted to get to hardware design um, next and that is indeed the plan. And one of the things that's going to change is that um, the kind of the meta language I guess we're going to be using for for most of that stuff is Python. Uh, so our hardware description language, which we're going to make ourselves, is uh, is going to be an embedded domain specific language uh, written in Python. Um, so in some sense, the compiler and all the analysis tools uh, are going to be written in Python, but the but the language itself, like the code in the language we're designing, is also going to be Python code. Uh, and a side effect of executing the Python code is that it's going to build up a representation of, you know, an abstract syntax tree or an abstract uh, syntax graph. So uh, anyway, for today, I just wanted to kind of gradually ease into that. Not really folk. We are going to be doing some stuff that has uh, a direct relationship to logic design and HDLs, but um, I'm not really going to be focusing on that so much. It's just kind of getting started with some some ideas around DSLs in Python and uh, showing. Uh, showing the basics of that. So um, I will be using, un unless I get really frustrated with it, I will be using Visual Studio Code for um, for our Python stuff because it has an embedded debugger that has decent features. Um, and um, it has some issues, but uh, it's the best I've found. Uh, and I may give it up entirely if I get really annoyed at its weird hiccups and performance issues. But for now, um, I'm going to stick with it. Um, all right, let me just make sure this still works. But yeah, anyway, um, yeah, so this is bizarre. I mean, this, this, this makes no sense. I'm having some weird issues with the debugger. Okay, so that works. I was trying to step over that even though it was paused on it and it wasn't making progress. But anyway, okay. So uh, where to start? Um, I think for today, and we'll probably spend about an hour on this and see how far we get, um, I wanted to show some of the basic ideas about the embedded domain-specific languages, write a simple uh, interpreter for that fragment we come up with, um, and uh, maybe a uh, you know a kind of dumb 
non-functional compiler, like just to show kind of the idea of how the same representation can be interpreted in different ways, depending on what you want to do with it. And um, um, and the idea is going to be pretty simple. It's basically, we're going to build up some sort of AST-like structure um, and we're going to make it uh, look as good as possible. So, you know, if you're doing something like this, um, Um, all right. Um, so, so what should I be doing? Okay. Uh, like basically w what I'm trying to uh, say is that we're going to build up some sort of AST. Um, and since we're going to be doing logic design, uh, the basic, the basic data type for now just corresponds to a single bit. So it can be zero or one. Um, and so, um, I imagine we will have um, we will have some sort of constructor function that is called input. So you want to be able to to do something like this, um, and uh, these correspond to input nodes. So these represent sort of external inputs. If you want to think of it in chip terms, this is kind of like a pin or something like that um, that can have different values. And for now, everything is a single bit. Uh, later, we will add bit vectors and more complex data types. Um, and then you can add, um, you know, you can you can build up other expressions essentially um, uh, out of these. Like, um, you know, you could you could do this, and uh, and this is going to represent, you know, a bitwise and of those inputs. Um, and so, uh, what's involved in this is, I mean, essentially what this is is this is just like building some kind of AST node like this, um, but we're going to be using operator overloading extensively for this stuff so that everything looks like we're really writing a program in Python, even though really what it's doing is that when the Python code is executing, um, it's building up the syntactic structure that describes the structure of the computation, but it's not actually executing the computation. That part is delayed uh, for further analysis. So uh, let's try something like this to get started. So you might have... Um, um, so first off, let's say we have a superclass, um, and I'm, by the way, I know some people are allergic to anything involving object orientation. I really don't care. Uh, in languages, especially dynamic languages like Python, I use OO stuff extensively because it's uh, concise. It doesn't mean I have any kind of commitment to the ontology of what is and isn't an object and stuff like that, but it's convenient when doing, when sharing code and when doing dynamic dispatch stuff. So just wanted to get that out of the way. I am pretty non-dogmatic about that. Um, so uh, if you want to, uh, so, so suppose you want to have this super class and it basically is going to act for the most part as first off as a type tag so we can identify things that inherit from it by doing is instance. So on one hand it identifies subclasses with a tag we can easily check, um, but it also provides a bunch of mix-ins and in Python uh, operator overloads have to be methods. They can't be ex defined uh, sort of uh, externally. Um, and so this is a convenient way to mix them in. So suppose that, um, you know, just to make it really simple, suppose um, suppose we do something like this, uh, and then uh, and node is a, uh, uh, I have to turn off the IntelliSense, that's driving me nuts already. Um, so these binary nodes are just going to be like this. Uh, and I may even do do something like this, actually. Um, like there may, I, I may not even want to have a different class for each type, right? Like just like when we did our, uh, anyway, so we may do something like this. So all uh, binary operators are going to share the same type uh, and then we're just going to tag tag it with a string um, corresponding to the operator. Um, okay, something like this, um, just to get started. Then you have this thing here. Um, uh, for now, this 
for, for now, this is just going to uh, be a smart constructor, meaning this is a small thing, but I even when I'm doing OO stuff, I basically never call constructors directly in external code. Like not, that's not always true, but um, it's very convenient to have external smart constructor functions that can do things that are not just constructing a, an instance of a fixed type. Maybe they can do type conversion. Maybe they can do some dispatch to different types, uh, depending on the argument values. Um, so even in cases like this, where for now, um, for now, there's really not much uh, extra going on in this constructor function. I will generally have these kind of front end functions to to underlying classes. Um, so yeah, um, let's see. All right. So already, if we do this, um, this should be able to execute if I didn't make a mistake. Uh, there was no errors. Just to make sure. Okay, so it is it is running our code. So this is this is now working, uh, and from that you can infer that you know this overloaded operator wouldn't be available on, on, unless we were constructing an input node, which in turn inherits from node uh, and ends up calling this constructor. Um, and I mean we can uh, just to fill this in, we could we could make some automation for filling in this boilerplate. But let's just make these two nodes for now. Um, And I mean, let's let's make the unary one as well uh, while we're at it. Um, what to call this? Uh, something like that. Uh, and then I guess for this, you would do. Actually, let me just bring up the documentation. I think I have seal with uh, the Python stuff installed is not okay it doesn't even it doesn't even autocomplete okay I'm not sure I like this um, why doesn't it have magic uh, why doesn't it index that okay the reason I'm looking it up, I can't remember. It, it must be not. Um, this also gives me a chance to talk about some Python semantics that people may or may not know. Um, I think this is the right name. By the way, for some reason, um, this is something I've always noticed. Um, the official python.org documentation has terrible Google juice. Like every time I search for something that I want to hit, um, want to hit the official Python docs, it always, it, it almost never seems to hit that. Um, I mean, I could also just be misspelling this. Let's try add. Okay. So maybe the reason this was not working apparently is that it um, okay invert that's what I was looking for okay so in this case I can't blame that um, I want the Python three version okay so um, this is going to be a unary node. Um, Um, so yeah, let me let me make a small comment on on something that's related to this. Why why underscore uh, double underscore not doesn't uh, doesn't exist. The reason is that um, if you write something like this, um, and this will work. I mean, you can you can write this. I think uh, it shouldn't be any issue. But it doesn't. You, you basically you can't overload the logical operators um, like this. For example, it totally works, but it doesn't probably mean what you think um, what you can do is you can implement a magic method called I, th I guess it's non-zero or something like that um, or, or uh, logical or what is it cool yeah cool um, 
And so really what it does is when it, it tries to use a, some user defined type in the context of and and or and not, um, it calls a method to convert it to a Boolean and then it just has the hard coded behavior for Booleans with those operators. So um, in fact, um, I want to guard against this from the beginning because we can't overload those operators. Um, I actually want to um, um, uh, cannot treat uh, nodes as logical values. So let's uh, see if that works. So if I now try to do something like this, for example, I should get an error. Uh, oh, there should only be one argument. Right, so cannot treat nodes as logical values. And this is really important because when we're doing logic design, you will often, sometimes you'll be tempted to write something like this, um, where you try to like you, you get confused about the meta level and the object level, the meta level being the Python code that's executing the object level being, you know, the logic you're describing. So there's often cases where you want to do multiplexing and you'll be tempted to write stuff like this. Um, and uh, by doing, uh, by, uh, by having a throwing version of this underscore, uh, this bool magic method, we'll be able to catch all of these cases, which are, um, you know, we cannot really intercept them. And so by having this raise an error, we uh, we make sure that you don't accidentally, like for example, the, de the default Python behavior, if you don't have a bool uh, method or implemented for your type, uh, this basically means the same thing as, uh, means the same thing as X is not none um, when X doesn't have a bool. So because X has a value, it's not none, this just executes. And this is convenient in a lot of cases, but in our case, uh, it's way too error prone. So um, that's the motivation for having this uh, throwing version of bool. Um, and then you could do, let's see, you should be able to do something like this. Bad operand type for unary. Oh, that's interesting. So why is it not picking this up? Should it be called invert instead? Okay. Um. Alrighty, alrighty. So you can already see here, we have some code that just looks like normal. Like if you just look at this stuff, this just looks like normal program code, but really what it's doing is it's building up a, a well, like an AST, but in fact, one difference um, between uh, an AST and this kind of thing is that um, you can write this. So this, this thing here is actually not a tree, it's a graph. Because um, even though, so, so think of it this way, even though we're using variable names like Z and W, currently these don't exist at the level of the AST. These exist at the level of the meta language, which is, which is Python. So this really only serves in this case as a way to, well, on the one hand, just give convenient names to, uh, to values, which represent these syntax nodes. But also, it lets us reference the same syntax node multiple times. For example, here we're referencing C two times, which means that the node corresponding to W uh, actually has two different paths to Z, namely, um, you know, through the positive and through the negative polarity. You can see we have both the positive and the negative here. Um, and so, as a result of this, unlike the interpreters, uh, unlike the stuff we've seen before with compilers, this is actually a graph. Um, this is a graph instead of a tree. But uh, for a well-formed graph, it, it will be a so-called direct directed acyclic graph, a DAG, um, because even though there are uh, kind of multiple paths to nodes, there can't be any directed cycles. So um, 
And in fact, as long as you don't have mutation, as long as everything, all these nodes are constructed once and for all and don't change after the fact, you, you actually cannot construct in a non-lazy language, you actually cannot construct cycles. So uh, you, it, it's, it's very hard to accidentally end up with cycles as long as you're restricting yourself to this kind of functional language-like approach to constructing nodes. Um, if I start doing stuff like this, um, so you know, C is an AND node. If I start doing stuff like this, uh, now we have a cycle, um, but uh, here I'm mutating stuff. And there are cases where we'll find it helpful to mutate nodes in which case um, we will do an explicit sanity check to check for cycles before we try to interpret things. All right. Um, so, um, so, so that's just to, to, to wet our appetite. Now let's try doing something with these nodes. Um, so now we have a structure and we want to be able to, for example, interpret it. So we want to be able to, to write a simple interpreter over this kind of thing. Actually, that's not quite true. Let me, um, let me um, uh, let me do one other thing. Um, I also want to have constants. Um, so constants are just like things like zero or one. They're just constants. Um, for now, they will just be you know zero or one or true or false or something like that. Um, but uh, again, this is where having, having smart constructors is often useful. So um, uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, I'm just thinking of what I want to do. I think I'm going to make a uh, a smart constructor um, don't know what the name should be but um, suppose you 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 have this function called as node and the first thing it does is it checks if the thing is already a node and if it is then we just um, then we just return it as is so this is sort of a supposed to be an item potent conversion function um, for things that are already nodes but for other things, we want to be able to wrap them in the appropriate node type. Uh, so for example, um, if you're um, trying to remember what, uh, where's my Python interpreter? So if you have like 42, I'm trying to remember, I guess, I guess it's just called int, right? Um, right, it's just called int. So if you have an int, um, um, let's see, uh, then we make a constant node, um, and I guess we do it the same thing for bool. Um, something like this. And so now, if you want to do, um, so I, yeah, actually, let me think about it. We may have to be a little more lenient in our conversion because we want to be able to have some things like, for example, if I do, if I now do something like, first off, if I do this, I should get an error. Oh, wait, actually, that's not true because I have to, uh, okay, if this thing, you don't have to call it on, oh, this is, okay, I remember, I remember that one. The other thing we have to do is we have to implement this. Um, so let me explain something quickly about the reverse operator overload methods. The way that works is um, if you write something like this, I shouldn't use C comments. If you write something like this, um, and I'm sure I'm going to I'm going to forget about some special case, but for our purposes, here's how it works. 
uh, first looks for um, so basically the first operand always first gets a chance to dispatch so if the first operand has a, a magic underscore uh, method uh, for and that's the one that executes otherwise if that one doesn't have an overload then the right uh, operand uh, is allowed to to give it a try with r and and the reason is r and is that it's reverse and and you have to be aware that the self argument is actually the right operand rather than the left operand uh, and so that's why i'm reversing these here um, and one reason that's useful is first off if you want to be able to support suppose um, let, let me just write these out and then i'll give the example um, if you want to be able to do stuff like so, so okay so suppose um, so right now let, let me show you actually um, by first removing this and then putting it back in. So X is a, is a node, so it has an overload for AND. And so if I do something like this, that should work. I mean, we haven't really tested it, but yeah, that should work. Uh, and, and let's just check that if we use this, we should get a range error. Okay, we don't get a range error. Um, oh, because I haven't added my conversion yet. Um, so let's see. Um, Um, let me just add it to all of them so I don't forget. Um, okay, so now we get a range error because, uh, you know, this thing looks up the uh, AND method on X uh, and that ends up calling as node on um, on the right operand, which is one, two, three, this falls into this case. It does a range check. Uh, it fails the range check, and so it raises this value error. Um, um, if, however, I have something like this, it should it should go through. Um, now, without the reverse uh, overload, this would not work because one is a built-in type, and it doesn't support that. Right? It doesn't support that type combination. So um, that's the reason that this is super helpful. Um, so let me show how that works. Um, now that works, and, and you can, uh, yeah, anyway. So, so that's the, the, the motivation for this. And you can do this for all the binary operators. Um, it's kind of a convenient way of, of supporting some aspects of multiple dispatch, but in a way that doesn't open up the full can of worms, basically. Uh, it's a pretty simple concept, and it doesn't solve all the issues you might want solved with kind of the expression problem or whatever, but um, this is uh, works pretty well in practice. Many cases are handled quite smoothly. You don't have to worry too much about um, pitfalls. So, right. Um, so now all values are wrapped in these constants nodes, and we have binary and unary nodes, and we have input nodes, which represent, you know, at compile time, essentially, or at, at construction time, that represents unknown values, un unlike the... Uh, the constant nodes. Um, and maybe actually we should call these like variable node because that's really what it is. But variable has some has some semantic baggage or from imperative languages that may not be helpful. Um, but but let's actually call it a variable because in logic a variable often just means an unknown. Um, and so Let's call it variable node and let's have a, a shorter var shorthand for the um, for the constructor function. All right. Um, right, this should throw an error because one, two, three is out of range. Now, uh, one thing where I'm, I'm thinking that maybe this out of range thing is a little bit out of hand is if I do. Um, Trying to remember because you know I want I want I basically I want these operators to follow the usual laws uh, algebraic laws like if I do something like this um, I mean as a dumb example you know this should be the same 
uh, should be the same in some sense of, of, of sameness equivalence should be the same as this I mean this case is stupid obviously but you want to be able to do something like that and one thing that can be problematic if you're not careful is that um, when you group things this way it means that uh, this sub expression is evaluated totally under the purview of Python semantics for you know how bitwise or acts on these integers and so you do have to be a little bit careful that these are consistent uh, if you want things to be sane um, and so one case that immediately stood out is um, um, if you um, by the way this is I mean not really rocket science, but one of the nice things about a dynamic language is that when you're um, when you're broken at a point, you have the full language available executing in a context where you know the the different things on the stack frame are just like things you can look at. Um, anyway, so uh, the, the thing I want to say is like let's see what Python does for not uh, one. And uh, it's minus two. One of the this is the correct two's complement answer. Um, this is using the fact that um, in two's complement um, the following is true, and you can turn this around to define um, to define bitwise not as uh, minus x minus one. Um, And, and, the, and the reason, by the way, this is kind of significant is that when you're dealing with, like, so Python's integers are arbitrary precision, right? Like, you can do 2 to the 1,000 or something stupid. Um, and um, if you think about what, if, if you want to think about the infinite bit sequence that sort of corresponds to not one, it corresponds to an infinite, like it's an arbitrary precision number. It can, corresponds to an infinite, um, like in the same way that minus one would, you know, if you look at minus one in, in 32 bit, uh, two's complement, it just corresponds to all ones 32, 32 times. When you're looking at arbitrary precision, if you want to think of that as an infinite bit sequence, it's infinitely many ones. So anyway, I, I should have, predicted this, but I'm um, just checking my own sanity that this is what it does. But the implication of this is that um, we probably, I'll have to think about it, but we may want to um, to just do this straight up rather than doing a range check, because that way, you know, uh, no, I guess this doesn't really work. I have to think about it. If you want this to have the logical interpretation, then that's kind of a problem. Oops, not the right book. Um, let me check. Actually, I don't know what bitwise not on on true does. Right, so it converts it to an integer first. Okay. Um, I guess I have to take it modulo one. Which is a little bit of a weird. No, I guess that's not. That's a reasonable interpretation because what that's what that's doing is checking the least the least significant bit basically. Um, so let's just test some cases. All right, this is false. This is one. This is false. And this should be true. Yeah. So I guess this is maybe 
a reasonable, consistent interpretation, which just corresponds to taking the least significant bit anyway, which you know is reasonable. Um, Yeah, someone's asking about um, which one call it um, when you do and, when you use uh, and one and x, it first tries to run the int class and and then that fails and yeah, so that's exactly right. Um, l let me actually show you how you could do that yourself. Uh, I mean. The, is, I guess it's turning more into a Python hackers tutorial or something like that. But, uh, you know, today's going to be pretty loose anyway. But yeah, what you can do actually is, um, I mean, okay, here's basically what you can do. So suppose, suppose you're implementing the non, the, so there's a standard, uh, there's a standard error called not implemented error. And, you can do some uh, some fancy uh, check. You can do this, uh, and, and you know, s suppose it's a function of both self and other. Uh, and you, you know, if this fails, then you can raise not implemented error. And um, if this is thrown, then the interpreter will try the R and on the other operand. So this is, I mean, in the case of int and like those built-in types, this is obviously written in C code rather than Python code. But if you wanted to emulate the behavior of how that works, that's how you would do it. So if you wanted to implement uh, those operators for your own integer-like type, you could do some dynamic type checks like this in the uh, you know the forward version of that operator. And um, if you if um, if if it doesn't conform to what type cases you're willing to handle, you raise this not implemented error, which signals to the interpreter that it should try R and rather than uh, just throwing an overall error to the user. So that's how that works under the hood. Um, but in the case of, yeah, the built-in types like int, I don't think it, it actually uses exceptions. That's too inefficient. But you can do that if you want to do the equivalent for user-defined types. Um, all right. But yeah, so it's, it, it is actually pretty flexible in that respect. Um, okay, okay, okay. Um, okay, let's write a simple interpreter for this stuff. Um, one thing I'm going to do, which is maybe not the conventional sort of OO way of doing things, and, and like I'm not going to define, even though it would be convenient uh, in some cases, I'm not going to define the evaluation functions on as methods on the different uh, node types. And the reason is I don't want to commit like you know if you think of interpretation for example that's just one particular kind of analysis and i don't want to have to dump every new type of analysis we want to do over the ast i don't want to have to like ram them into these existing types so i would rather do the dispatch externally using a hash table or you know something like that um you know rather than um you know, rather than doing something like evaluate, uh, you know, you, you, you can you can totally do this and that's fine. But um, it also doesn't have a lot of value for us because we're not gonna really have a inheritance hierarchy. Like right now, we, we just have two levels. We have node at the top. The primary purpose of node is really just to inject these overloaded operators. Um, it's also convenient that we can use, um, we can use this to, to check whether something is a node. So it also serves as a, a tagging mechanism, but we're not really going to, you know, we're not going to have a higher key where we want to uh, use kind of virtual dispatch or anything like that. Um, we're just going to do it directly on the type rather than dispatching through the inheritance higher key or anything like that. So um, just to explain that rationale. Um, so, so let's do a, um, let's do a uh, evaluation function. And there's going to be a top level function called evaluate and you're supposed to pass in a dictionary called state which basically is going to be a dictionary that maps from variable objects which are the ones that don't have any spe previously specified value um, you specify what values you want them to have um, and then everything else is computed ultimately bottoming out in constants and those variables and when you hit those variable nodes you look up you look up their value in the state mapping. 
Um, so that's the idea. All right. So uh, how is this going to work? Um, I haven't thought a lot about how I want to do this long term. So let's just do something very basic to begin with. Um, there's various ways you can use decorators and other or all kinds of visitor like things if you want to sort of make generic dispatching mechanisms. But let's just do it very barehanded for now um, and use a dictionary. Um, so um, I'm just going to actually let's let, I guess we let maybe let's uh, let let us actually um, okay let's let, let's be a little bit fancy because that's one of the fun things about Python you can just hack stuff um, um, Nah, let's let's do it simple-mindedly as first. So um, so let's just define some uh, some functions corresponding to the types. Um, so evaluate variable is just going to basically look up. Um, it's it's going to use the node as a key into the hash table. Now in Python, when you do this, uh, if you don't in implement the uh, magic hash, hash method. Uh, and actually, I, I should start using the right terminology. I was calling it double underscore. I think Python people calls it dunder for double under. So dunder dunder hash, which is uh, is this. Um, if you don't implement this, then the hash corresponds by default to uh, to just the pointer value essentially of the underlying thing. Uh, and similarly, equality. If you don't overload uh, equality, you just get pointer equality, which actually is often what you want um, for for these sorts of things. So uh, in this case, we're just going to directly use uh, node as a pointer value uh, to index into this table. Um, and then for um, for these other things, um, for, uh, for this, um, you could do, I mean, there's different things you could do, I guess. Um, so maybe not be Python improved, but let's do something like this. Um, I mean, I guess I could even use This doesn't really give you any leverage. You couldn't have gotten another way, but um, yeah, let's just write it out. There's really no reason not to. Um, And so we are going to recursively evaluate, um, be before calling those functions, we're going to recursively evaluate the nodes so that by the time uh, these things get called, they're not dealing with nodes, they're dealing with values. That's why they can just directly use you know, these two operations, which in this case are now doing whatever bitwise stuff to, to, the, you know, to the underlying things. Um, And I mean, there's no reason we have to, uh, we, we might as well just put all of them in one table um, like this. There's no reason really to, um, uh, when we hit a, a constant, we actually just grab the value directly. Um, uh, 
and then here we have to um, and again this is my simple-minded dispatch mechanism um, is that I just associate um, I just associate the types directly and there's no there's no you know multi-level dispatch because of inheritance or anything um, and of course we're not doing error handling but things will throw exceptions if we're doing weird shit I think one thing we have to do here um, is that we have to we have to do this um, because, as we saw before, well, actually, we can just do this. We can actually just do not in this context because we're just uh, we're already dealing with logical values. Because let's see, um, let's do it like this. Um, inductively, if we do this, we always make sure we have a Boolean value. This will also incidentally do some kind of type checking as a side effect. Um, this thing here, uh, because constants are always converted at the point of construction, those are also guaranteed to be Booleans. And uh, this here doesn't construct anything new. Um, and so this actually should work. Um, Okay, let's see if that compiles. Uh, there, oh, right. I have to go back like that. Okay. And so now let's try some simple cases. Um, if I do um, Let's try something really dumb. Um, actually, I guess I just want uh, I just want to go into the interpreter or the REPL. Um, okay, so here, if I do evaluate uh, one, or if I do evaluate true. Um, we get true if if you do this, you get false, uh, and so that works for that. If I try to do a variable like var x, I should get a lookup error, right? Uh, again, this error is not very friendly, and we can fix that later. But if I now do, um, okay, so suppose we we put this into a variable. Um, so just to replicate what we did before, we should get that again. But now, if I uh, if I do something like like this, uh, we should get true, and if I do this, we should get false. Um, and now, um, let's say C is the bitwise and or let's say do or actually. Oh, so Y is another. Let's make another variable. Um, and so that's it. And now, if we go and evaluate uh, Z. Um, well, first off, note that if I do this, that's not sufficient. Um, but if I do this, now everything should be evaluated and it's false. But if at least one of them is true, this whole thing should be true. Um, except for if both of them are true. So anyway, um, that is how you write a simple interpreter um, for a embedded domain specific language. Now granted, this is very, very trivial as far as these things go. How are we doing on time? Okay, we, we have a little more time. Uh, this is trivial as far as these things go, but um, uh, I'll, I'll maybe do some more stuff uh, before we finish off, but that's already giving you the idea, I think. So um, 
of some of the kind of the, the tricks we'll be using repeatedly. One is to have a superclass to inject these overloads and also to serve as a common tag. Uh, then we have these nodes that on their own are really just uh, data, data structures, like there was not really behavior on the nodes per se. Um, then there is a smart conversion function, which acts idempotently on things that are already nodes. And for other things, it, it converts them, but it also does dynamic type checking uh, in case where it can't convert it. Um, in this case, it's just a shorthand. Later, it will do some fancier stuff. Uh, and then for the actual uh, interpreter, it's all sort of externalized uh, using, um, whatchamacallit, using um, kind of dynamic dispatching techniques, but not using, you know, virtual uh, methods or anything like that, using just like normal tables and doing type-based dispatch and uh, using pointer equality and pointer hashing and stuff like that. Um, and of course, I mean, like I could have made these lambdas as well if I really wanted to, but in anticipation of more complex behavior, I'm just keeping these like this for now. Uh oh, not implemented. Oh, return not implemented, I see. So the one was just commenting on the uh, reverse uh, operator overload thing. Um, all right, um, let me think. Okay, let me think about something here. Um, okay, let me um, let me show a trick um, that I, I, I mentioned earlier. That really, in some sense, we're not dealing. I, I keep saying AST, and maybe I'll probably still not be very careful about making that distinction. But really, we're dealing with graphs. And in particular, um, um, if you if you do something like this, I mean here it's kind of trivial, so I don't want to overstate the usefulness of this. But I'm going to artificially make some um, I'm going to artificially make some tree. Um, with uh, that, that is takes exponential time to evaluate if you do it as a tree, um, but if you share the results, it's uh, it's like linear time. So just to make the point, um, and so I don't know what's a good number sixteen. Um, This is not very useful, but um, something like this. So basically what this does is it takes a variable and it constructs this nested tree where at every level you reference two copies of the previous levels node. Um, and so um, what's that thing called? Time it. Uh, just want to kind of show it to you quantitatively. Um, so, so, so for, first off, let me just do like four. Let me just uh, for show you this working. Um, And of course, this is a trivial computation because we're not really trying to. All right, <laughs> I've been I've done so much Python too that I'm still used to print being a uh, statement. So anyway, this evaluates. Let's try making it something like uh, 16 deep. You see how it runs and runs and runs. Um, we can try to measure how long that took. Um, Oh, and it likes to run things 10,000 times, so we definitely don't want to to do that. Um, what was it? Evaluate. Um, evaluate y in a context where a x is 
true. Um, and number should be one. Is it treating this is um, I think there's an easier. Lambda thing to you can use it with. Uh, oh, I guess it evaluates it in a different context. Isn't there one with a lambda? Yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I could use a roster, but I don't really know why that would cause an issue. Yeah, I don't think that's the issue. Um, I mean, screw it. It's not really. Anyway, let's just eyeball it because we could already see it before. So let's not get down. I'll look at that afterwards. Um, so anyway, if you guys look, look how long it's running. 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 It's, running, it's done. If, uh, if I made this like this, I can almost guarantee you it would never finish. Um, because it's going to take 4 billion steps, basically. Um, because even though this expression is not very deep, the way it's doing the evaluation is that even though the same identity-wise, the same node is occurring in different places and, and will always have the same value, we're not exploiting that sharing, right? We're not exploiting that sharing. Uh, and one way you can do that is by memorizing things. Um, and um, there's different ways we can implement this, but basically what it amounts to is that if a given node is evaluated more than once during the course of an overall evaluation, we want to reuse the value from previously, so we only want to compute it once. And uh, you could do that with explicit memorization, where uh, which I'm probably going to do now that I think about it. So um, Here's what I'm going to do. First off, um, we get in an initial state, and I will just assume that this is some dictionary-like thing. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to convert it to my own dictionary, uh, which also means, as incidentally, it doesn't have to be provided as a dictionary. It could be provided as a list of key-value pairs, for example. Um, um, and so, I, we're going to change actually a little bit how this stuff works because here we're evaluating, we're calling um, evaluate directly. I want evaluate to be the front end. So only the front end should create a new copy and only the front end should do this node conversion. That's only really required at the top level. Um, so I want to, I, mean, I guess I could call it eval. Uh, I can't remember. I think Python has something called eval, but. Uh, or maybe they removed it. So let me just uh, have that be it. So um, something like this. Uh, as, aside from kind of canonicalizing the representation of the state, it also means that we can now we own this mutable copy of the of the state dictionary, and we can actually overwrite it. So now you can you can do something like this. Um, you can say I guess we can use the
So this is the classic kind of cache front end. Um, and so we're going to change all of these to use the eval function instead. Um, and I think this is called eval and built in Python, so I should probably rename it later, but I'm just going to leave it like this for now. So we're not going to, yeah, um, it is going to end up memorizing these things as well. Uh, all right. I guess one issue potentially is that it will actually never call this function um, because it's always going to hit the cache. Um, Okay, um, let's try that. So we look up the node to see if there's an associated value. If there isn't, then we actually go and evaluate it. Um, and then we cache the value and we return it. Okay, so this now, well, I guess we should check that it still works, but I mean, this is always going to return true, right? If I do this, it's always going to return false, regardless of the value. Um, so anyway, let's just say that this works. Uh, I'll verify, you know, that we didn't break stuff. Um, just as a... Um, Let me just um, break it out like this so I can print the dictionary. Um, just to make sure it gets filled in. Yeah, so you can see there's a bunch of things that get filled in, not just variable, uh, variable nodes, which are there from the start, that's what you pass in, but also binary nodes and unary nodes. And you can see there's not that many nodes here. There's, I guess it's roughly um, on the order of you know, 16 times whatever, or 16 times three or something like that. Um, so anyway, um, so let's say that's it now. So, so anyway, you noted how much faster it was. It's instantaneous now because it's only going to execute on the order of, you know, three times 16, uh, individual node evaluations. Um, because everything is cached. So even though if you treated this as a tree, there would be roughly 64,000 or a bit more, like on the order of 64K nodes. Uh, and once we move to here, there would be on the order of 4 billion, uh, actually a multiple 4 billion nodes. Uh, and that would basically, I mean, I guess it would eventually terminate, but it would take a long time given that we're evaluating things in Python with a fairly heavyweight scheme. Um, but this should now be instantaneous uh, because it's actually sharing the result of the, uh, of those computations. Um, and this is the kind of thing that if you want to faithfully represent the graph structure, you need to do. Um, otherwise, you're not respecting the structure that's there. You know, in uh, and of course, in terms of preserving behavior, if you don't care about like runtime or area in the case of a chip or something like that, you can always replicate nodes, right? Like in a, in a same as in a, in a purely functional language, you can always, um, you know, you can always replace the right-hand side for a variable binding with the left-hand side, but that it can generally cause an exponential blow up in the evaluation time. Um, or in the case of a chip in the chip area, like if you redundantly duplicate all kinds of logic, sometimes it can be useful to do so, but you know, it has an effect on area or time or whatever. Um, and this is the same kind of thing where, sure, we will get the same result regardless of how we uh, evaluate it, but doing it this way um, where we respect the sharing that's implied by that pointer structure of the graph, uh, we get an exponential speed up. Um, but really, the exponential speed up is not in some sense the real reason we're doing this. It's because we want to respect the actual structure of the graph rather than treating it as a tree when it's really a graph. Okay. 
So I think that's it for um, I think that's it for today. That's about an hour and a half. Uh, still basic stuff. I figure we'll probably have a few sessions like this to ease people into it, uh, especially for all my um, my C homies who are maybe not so used to to the style of programming. Uh, I I really like the you know I really like Python. I know some people have various hangups with it, but uh, it's a fun hacking language. And uh, there are good reasons I'm choosing this. It's not just personal preference, and that will become evident later when we get deeper into it. Um, but yeah, this is a very basic example of of how to do a DSL in Python, uh, and we will be kind of ex be expanding this as we go along. Um, but I think that's it for today. Uh, anyone have questions? Let me just see what people are writing. Uh, what's my end game? Well, the end game is we're going to design a hardware design language in Python, a hardware description language in Python. It will have a simulator in Python that's in this style we're seeing here. So you can, without using external tools, you can sort of work with circuit fragments and evaluate them and get some estimated costs and stuff like that. Um, then there will be a Verilog. Uh, it will compile to Verilog. And from the Verilog, you can either get a very later simulation, which generates C code, or you can uh, run it through an FPGA or an ASIC tool flow to generate a, a chip design. Uh, and so um, this will basically be be that. It will be a language that we can retarget. Uh, like ultimately, the hard constraint is we have to be able to generate a net list uh, that we can push through, um, you know, say Silinxes or Altera's uh, toolchain to generate an FPGA uh, bitstream that we can actually deploy and you know, we have a working chip that way. In theory, it could be used with ASICs, but obviously the tools for that are kind of inaccessible. Um, but yeah, that's 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 the end game. Um, but we're going to, as everything else we've done so far, we're going to take it in baby steps. And this is just uh, a tiny taster for today. Um, someone's asking, do you think the Intel 8086 chip will be within the direct scope of this project? I don't know what you mean by within the direct scope. I mean, the 8086 is, no, it's not something we're going to be covering. Do you mean x86 or do you really mean the original 8086? Because that chip is not, I mean, I guess if you're very interested, once once I've shown you shown how you can design chips, uh, you could try to design an 8086 compatible chip. but um, most of the chips we'll be focusing on will be in a slightly different direction, like risk, more risk-like, which tend to involve less microcode and stuff like that, if any microcode at all. Um, so, I mean, no, we won't be covering stuff like that directly, but I mean, you can transfer your knowledge hopefully to that if it's something you're interested in. All right. Um, Alrighty, but yeah, um, that's it for today, and we will be continuing with this in the next several sessions, and gradually we will start building up something more like a real language. And uh, I plan to cover a bunch of standard logic design along the way, like the stuff. I kind of at a breakneck breakneck pace. Like once we once we have enough of a language that I mean, even it doesn't take much more than this actually to have the basic Boolean logic stuff. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll show all the standard stuff, like how to design an adder and mul multipliers and all these different data path circuits that you learn about in, uh, in undergraduate classes. So I'll try to blast through that uh, since there'll be, there'll be good case studies for how great Python is for, or not just Python, but how great it is to do this style of embedded DSL uh, and how, how simple you can write generic, like a generic adder that works for any bit width or is parameterized in some way. Um, and so we'll get to that uh, in the next couple of sessions. And then from there, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be focusing on what traditionally is called combinational logic for a while, which is basically just kind of stateless circuits. Um, and then we'll move to single clock, single synchronous circuits, which can cover quite a lot of territory. You can do simple processors with that. Uh, and then gradually we'll add multi-clock and uh, multi-clock synchronous where the different uh, frequencies divide each other and then eventually we'll do fully asynchronous uh, clocks and stuff. But uh, we'll do it stepwise. We'll start with combinational logic, which is the, the basics and the foundation for everything else.
and we'll, we'll, we will move from there. All right, cool. So yeah, thanks for hanging out. I'll see everyone next time.